lot of people are curious about what the potential might be for artificial intelligence in the future of medicine and healthcare. I've spent the last decade in the trenches of the AI revolution, and I've seen a lot of change. I work on something called artificial neural networks, which has turned out to be a workhorse technology in the current AI revolution. But before I worked on computer neural networks, I was a neuroscientist studying neural networks in the real brain. And I can tell you without a doubt that the way that humans realize and the way that modern machines derive conclusions are very different. And that complementarity is ultimately a source of strength, an opportunity for us to make better decisions. And there are no decisions that are more important than the decisions that doctors must make every day. And that's why I believe that doctors who partner with artificial intelligence as a decision-making aid will see their healing powers expand more than they have in 100 years. But let's wait a minute. Let's uh, get our bearings a little bit. Technologists make a lot of promises. And those promises don't always turn out. So let's talk about how we got here and see if we can tease apart the reality from the hype. The AI revolution today truly is a renaissance, a rebirth. But a rebirth is predicated on a death. And AI's first death is very relevant to its future in healthcare and medicine. So what happened? Well, in the 1970s and 80s, there were a spate of really important scientific innovations in machine learning and artificial intelligence. But some more optimistic futurists and maybe even a few opportunistic hucksters oversold the capacity for AI to affect change in the near term. And when those promises weren't delivered upon, the shadow of those failures chilled faith in the field to sub-zero temperatures to the point that it gave rise to what was called the first AI winter. Well, it's spring again in AI. In the last few years, we've seen a truly unprecedented expansion in our ability to apply artificial intelligence to practical real-world situations. Not just things in the test laboratory, but real problems in the, in the nitty-gritty, dirty real world. Feisty Silicon Valley startups are pinning their hopes on AI-enabled product strategies, while uh, tech giants rush to field ever more magical-feeling user-facing AI services. From uh, speech recognition to music recommendation, from driving directions to spam filtering, a huge fraction of the things that you expect from your smartphone and, and laptop are powered by AI. Just one example of a technology that I helped work on was the complete overhaul of Google's machine translation system. I found myself in a, mo in a restaurant in Moscow this summer that didn't happen to have an English menu. But with today's AI, I could just hold up my smartphone and see the Russian translated into English through the lens. Broken English to be sure, but good enough that I was able to order something delicious. Now, that would have been science fiction in 2010, but now it's something that's in, in your pocket. How is this possible? Well, it's all based on something called machine learning. And machine learning is a, a, an underlying fundamental technology in artificial intelligence, and it's the engineering approach that has powered many of these innovations that we're all experiencing today. Machine learning isn't actually a new idea. It's decades old. It's, it's actually something from before even the winter. And the core idea is very simple, that when you want a machine to do some simple repetitive task, like sort through your emails, you could write a detailed set of rules that define the boundaries and allow the machine to, to sort things out. But with machine learning, there's an alternative, and maybe a much better one, which is to give a learning machine a stack of representative cases of each of the various categories and have the machine buy, learn by example to sort things out. And if it makes some mistakes, you correct it and the machine gets better. 
It's basically learning through imitation. And it's this imitation game that stands behind a lot of the AI products and services that you guys use. For example, Smart Reply, a surprisingly popular automated email reply service, learned to pen one-line replies to emails by imitating replies that humans wrote to emails gone by. Now, to many people's surprise, it doesn't actually take a building full of software engineers to make some of these things work. For example, this young hacker outside of Tokyo last year wanted to help his aging parents sort cucumbers for their cucumber farm. And his mother has a very specific way that she wants the cucumbers categorized, but it's not the kind of thing that she can tell you rules in her head for how it works. It's something that you would have to learn by doing it. She doesn't, can't tell you the rules in her head because she doesn't have rules in her head. In, so instead, our hacker had his mom sort the cucumbers into representative examples. He took photos of them, and he used an open source machine learning toolkit to build a, an automated sorting robot for his parents' cucumbers farm. Now that seems pretty amazing. But it also sounds pretty simple. And in fact, this technology is so simple that some people use the pejorative term narrow AI to describe it. Now, I really wish we had settled on a, a, another term like specific AI or maybe even focal AI because nobody ever really enjoyed being called narrow. <laughs> but the alternative to being specialized, to being good at one thing, is to be general, to be kind of good at everything. But in my opinion, the prospect of artificial general intelligence is something that's maybe not particularly desirable, and I see no sign of it being close. Having just finally gotten computers to recognize cucumbers and photographs, it seems like quite a leap to imagine that we are therefore on the verge of discovering the underlying algorithms of intelligence. I therefore encourage us to focus on the foreseeable future of artificial intelligence, which is machines that are very good at some specifically defined tasks. After all, it was optimism about general intelligence and exponential growth that led us into some of the froth that foretold the first AI winter. And those of us who are old enough to remember don't want to see us repeat that mistake. But what does this have to do with medicine? At this point, some of you might think that I'm an AI pessimist, but I'm not. I believe the future, the real future, is a very bright one. I don't think it's going too far to say that AI might be as important to medicine in the next 100 years as antibiotics were in the last. Now, how is that possible? What kinds of things will AI and machine learning allow us to do? Well, to practice medicine today is to weather an information hurricane. Digital health systems may have improved provider productivity, but they're completely outstripped by demand and growth for desires to care. And as that demand for care grows, we need new ways of taking the information that's available and actually using it to practice medicine. The electronic medical record, for all of its obvious advantages, has created as much headache and heartache as any paper system ever did. And I believe that artificial intelligence and machine learning is our best opportunity to tame the data beast and actually scale care to meet demand. The future that I imagine is one where doctors see computers as welcome and trusted multipliers and magnifiers of their ability to provide healing care. And that's really what I'm excited about. Let me give you a specific example of a problem that we've worked on, which is digital pathology. Pathologists currently provide the gold standard for diagnosis in cancer by looking at stacks of huge slides responsible for identifying every anomaly. But time is so limited and the cases are so complicated that sometimes needles in the haystack are missed. 
And a committee of pathologists will find things that were not originally identified that might have changed the diagnosis. But if you're looking for needles in a haystack, what if I could give you a magnet? I believe that's the kind of thing that artificial intelligence could offer to medicine. And it's the same argument, which is that even if pathologists can't quite put into words what they're looking for, they could give machines examples of the kinds of things that are interesting and the kinds of things that are red herrings. And the machines can learn to identify these things. And just like the cucumber farmer, they can help. The idea of computer-aided diagnosis or computers helping with the analysis of images is obviously nothing new. I'm not here to tell you that this is a new idea. I'm here to tell you that this idea that has been around for a while is finally working really well. And it's working well not just in pathology, but in radiology, in dermatology, in ophthalmology, anywhere where images are used in diagnosis. But I also don't want to leave you with the impression that this only applies to medical imaging. I actually think that the opportunities to apply assistive narrow AI to medicine extend as far as the horizon. Whether it's clinical decision support or risk forecasting or helping you with a note or even just getting billing out of your way so that you can get on with being a doctor. I believe that the role that machine learning and artificial intelligence has to play in healthcare is enormous. But even though I believe that, I think that there are a few caveats that we should take away. So the first thing is don't expect miracles. No AI can predict the future or tell you what's best for your patient. Like a human colleague, the best that an AI can do is offer a supporting opinion. And like a human colleague, the value of that opinion varies from case to case and depends on the real life experience or data that support those conclusions. Second, don't go away thinking that these machines learn on their own. They don't. One size fits all, ready to go machine learning in, a, in the box is a waste of time and money. And if the people who work on these systems stop working on Thursday, the machines will stop learning anything useful by the next Tuesday. It takes a village to build an AI. It takes a clinical scientist to identify which tasks are even worth doing, data scientists to organize the examples the machine will learn from, machine learning researchers to tailor the system to what it is that it's going to learn to do, and software engineers to build reliable systems that implement these functions. And then more clinicians to verify that it's actually working. Building AI that works for doctors will require doctors. Lots and lots of doctors. Next, don't get dragged into a debate about which things humans do better and which things machines do better. Calculators have been adding numbers better than I can for my entire life. That didn't mean that mathematics was irrelevant or that you could hire a calculator instead of a mathematician. The real opportunity here is to build more powerful tools and to clear away drudgery. And I believe that this is where the opportunity is for healing powers to really be magnified by artificial intelligence technologies. After all, the purpose of AI is to build machines that are not like humans, but are useful to humans. Now, one of the ways that we could make AI's predictions more useful to humans would be to make them understandable to humans. And as a commonly leveled charge that machine learning systems are black boxes, that they're somehow inscrutable vending machines of imperfect advice. But this is a gross mischaracterization. In fact, we control exactly how it is that these machines learn. We even have the power to restrict what clues they use in their decision calculus. And every day we get better at peering inside the machine to understand how it is that it's doing what we've asked it to do. So this image is an example of an analysis that we ran on one of our visual object recognition systems in order to be able to see inside the machine to see what each of thousands of little components of the machine are doing and are looking for. 
And this same kind of technology can be used to give doctors what they need as well. For example, just don't just tell me that this patient should be referred to an ophthalmologist for diabetic retinopathy. Show me which pixels in the image led to that conclusion. And I believe that this is the kind of interpretability and explainability that matters. No one gets on a jet airplane and asks to see a diagram for the engines, but no one should get on an airliner if the computers in the cockpit are randomly rebooting themselves. And I believe that we can build medical AI that is reliable, as reliable and as safe as airplanes and car safety belts. And we have to, because the stakes are every bit as high. Medical decisions have a huge impact on all of our lives. This summer, some very good medical decisions brought a new baby into my life. And as I held him in the delivery room, I wondered what medicine would look like when he was old enough to make his own decisions. I believe the future is bright and that we always have at least as much to learn as we have to teach. Thank you.